Hey, what is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Super Lunch Pros Podcast, episode number 99. I am Brendan, almost at 100. Uh, <clears throat> today, we're going to talk about UFC 271, uh, Adesanya versus Whitaker 2. I know that I am one day behind when I normally post these. I mentioned that last week. I was climbing um, uh, Angel's Landing. My wife and I were climbing that on Saturday. So, that uh, took a lot of focus, <laughs> and honestly, I didn't get to the fights until today. I watched them all. I avoided Twitter. I avoided all social media. I managed to avoid spoilers and everything, and I watched them with fresh eyes. So I'm hoping that I'm going into this with uh, without bias outside of my natural biases, which are going to always be there. You can't get rid of everything. And uh, yeah. So before we get into it, please, if you like what I do, if you like talking about and hearing about MMA, you know, it's one of those things where I, I, I listen to a ton of podcasts about MMA just to hear more people talk about it, to get more, you know, exposure to different people's opinions, um, how, how they think fights went, you know, uh, things to look out for. I've learned a ton about MMA by listening to people who watch MMA frequently, right? Obviously listening to fighters and listening to Uh, different technique experts is is very helpful as well but just generally speaking a lot of people getting a lot of opinions it helps uh, you know formulate a more complete picture of MMA in general so like I said if you like that kind of stuff if you like those things and if that you find yourself doing that as well please like this video and subscribe because I do post these every single week I go over the UFC uh, pretty much every or not pretty much every single UFC card and then I cover odds and ends in Bellator and some other things. So, all right, that's enough of that nonsense. Let's get into it. All right. <laughs> Adesanya versus Whitaker 2. This fight, sorry, I'm pausing because I laid out in the preview how how I thought Whitaker could win, right? His path to victory. And he did exactly what he needed to do. So obviously, so for those of you guys who didn't know, why are you watching this? Uh, but Adesanya ends up getting the decision. Uh, one of those scorecards was a little wonky, but uh, I believe two of the other scorecards were more on track of what it should have been. Here's what I don't understand. Not not what I don't understand, sorry. Here's what I I find unfortunate is the one-sidedness of the commentary team was very influential on the public outcome, right? The public view of the outcome of this fight. I think those in the know and people who watch MMA frequently can form a more nuanced opinion and can kind of put that commentary stuff to the side uh, have realized that it's not it didn't go down exactly how they said it did, right? Uh, if you listen to the commentary and that's all you listen to, this is going to sound, it, it sounded like a, a complete shutout, 5-0 uh, to Adesanya. That's just not the case, okay? Adesanya got the decision, um, 48-47, 48-47, and 49-46. That one is the one that is possible, right, with the judging criteria, but I don't agree with that one in the slightest. Uh, in my opinion, so... The f- the first minute of the fight was a slow, uh, slow start. A lot of distance gauging. Whitaker just did not get it going in the first round. By the way, if you want to look at the striking totals here, I mean he landed nine, but they they were very insignificant, significant strikes, uh, and uh, he got dropped at one point by Adesanya. Um, Adesanya was focusing on the legs early, uh, and going to the body, so he was using a lot of distance striking, and he was. Uh, more aggressive than he has been in the past, and I think that kind of changed how Whitaker uh, approached this fight because the patience that he needed to have and I believe kept him in this fight and kept the fight very close, like razor thin, I think it threw off his game plan slightly. Uh, We'll get into that later about how he felt about it. Uh, you know, and you know, you, you, we saw a couple blitzes, you know, the, the Bobby Knuckles blitz where he uh, rushes in, throws, and then gets that left, the left hook, but it didn't follow it with a high kick. Uh, nothing doing. Adesanya was wise to it. No real damage. Nothing was done there. And, 
Uh, at the two-minute mark, that's when Adesanya dropped him. And it, it was a clear round for Izzy. This was by far, round one was the clearest round for Adesanya. Like, I don't think there can be an argument made that Whitaker won this one. I don't think anybody's making that argument. Let's move past it. Second round. This is a very, very close round and very deceptive. Because if you listen to the commentary, it sounds like Adesanya dominated this round as well. And because of positioning, maybe you thought that. But this round, okay, Whitaker started more aggressive. And he's he landed a few hooks early on. That's why the striking numbers were so close in the second round, 16 to 12. Right, if we look over here, 16 to 12 in favor of Adesanya. So Adesanya is still winning on the striking totals. And I'll get to what I thought about this round in a second. But um, Whitaker got his first successful takedown at 2 minutes and 40 seconds uh, and a nice little fence grab from Adesanya to get up. No damage done by Whitaker. Uh, the fence grab wasn't egregious, but it's a fence grab nonetheless. It just didn't get caught because it was very fast. This round was extremely close, and I even wrote it in my notes when I watched it live. Well, not live, but when I watched it back, right? So I don't like to be influenced by knowing the results. So when I'm watching the first time, I have my first impression, then I'll go back and I'll look at the striking totals, the actual striking totals, to see if my opinion might be swayed, right? Because how I saw that round, I gave that second round to Izzy. But I wrote in here, I have to look at the numbers, because the takedown and what Whitaker was able to do could have swayed me towards Whitaker. The 16 to 12 plus the damage, I still give it. To, this round is so close. This round is the deciding factor, and we'll get into that in a second. But this one is the deciding factor for me, and I still gave it to Adesanya. But barely, just barely. We are talking about a razor, razor close round here. And it might not seem like it, because if you go back with the way Adesanya carries himself and the way he looks like he's doing damage, watch that round. I've watched it again, just the second round specifically, because this was the close round for me. Go back and watch it again, and you tell me what you think. But I'm telling you hold on, that this round is a lot closer. Turn off the commentary, by the way, because that is not helping anybody. It actually makes things quite difficult um, to to be objective about. There's just a there's a lot of things in here in this round that can sway back and forth, and I I think that I really think um, the way to oh, crap. Sorry, got to get rid of all these. I'm currently doing management because. Otherwise, I'm going to run out of room on my PC because I'm an idiot. <laughs> so dumb. Okay, there we go. Now I should be good. Anyway, like I was saying, th this round is super close. If you go back and watch it without the commentary, you're going to see that it, it really depends on what you're looking for, what you're looking at, how you grade that takedown versus and control, how much damage you think one of uh, Izzy's shots versus one of Whitaker's shots did. There's... There's an argument to be made for both these people, for both these guys, and this is why the judging criteria and the modern MMA scoring and all those things can allow two people to see the exact same round and get a different result and follow the rules, follow the rules to a T. Okay, but for me, I went, I, I went to Izzy. All right, uh, third round was more uh, stationary from both guys. There was a little bit less. I mean, there was still movement, but there was less. Uh, I wouldn't say frantic, but it seemed like they were more stationary and more ready to stay in the middle, right? The That was less moving in and out towards the back of the cage in the third round. Uh, Whitaker did catch a kick and got him down, spending some time riding the back while they were standing, but no real threat of submission in the sec in this third round. And the, the, th the leg kicks were really taking a toll. You know, they were uh, one of... Uh, Whitaker's legs went out at the with 40 seconds left in the third round. Very close round again. Okay, with that the takedown plus the back control. Very close round. 
And if you look at the striking numbers, almost a carbon copy of the round before, 17 to 12 as opposed to 16 to 12, right? Adesanya actually got less, he landed less strikes every single round, 18, 16, 17, 15, 13, okay? So he, he did worse and worse every single round um, as far as landing, right? His percentage went up and down here, left and right, whatever. It's just he landed less and... I think Whitaker was doing a really good job with his game plan. I think he did an excellent job. I think he did exactly what he needed to do. And I think this might have been one of the best case scenarios for Whitaker outside of a, you know, a, a knockout or something crazy happening. And it turned into a 50, 50. Okay. So I don't think I was wrong or outlandish with my predictions for this fight. I don't think I was way off with how I thought it would go. This is, pretty much exactly what Whitaker needed to do, and he did what he needed to do, and I'm surprised one of the judges didn't go towards him, uh, to be honest with you. I, th I figured there would be a split decision uh, at the end of this. So in the third round, he, he landed a, a good left hook. He got the, um, he got a double, double leg. No, no, sorry. At the start of the fourth, he got a good left hook. I wrote that down wrong. Uh, and then uh, Whitaker got a double in space, which was good for him because taking Izzy down in space is a very hard thing to do. Climbed to his back and then tried to get a rear naked choke while they were standing, but nothing was doing. This is the round where Whitaker started win on my book. And if you want to go strike for strike, damage for damage, uh, maybe Adesanya... Uh, Maybe he eked him out uh, on a damage per shot, but I would say, uh, if if anything, this one could be dead even as far as damage goes. So now we're looking at control, and then he did get that takedown. Whitaker did get that takedown. I, I have no problem giving this to Whitaker. In fact, when I watched it live, I gave this to Whitaker. Round four. And then in the fifth round, uh, with 240 left, Izzy gets an eye poke for free. Um, pressure and damage for Rob in the, uh, the final round. This one is so close and it really comes down to that second score. So I gave that last round again, we want to look here 13 to 10, not outlandish to give it to Whitaker, him getting that, getting the takedown in the, uh, the fifth round landing more damage. I felt like he did a very good job landing damage in the fifth round, uh, the fourth and fifth round went to Whitaker in my opinion. So it really comes down to how do you grade this second round? If you give it to Adesanya, he wins. If you give it to Whitaker, I think, you know, Whitaker should have gotten that belt. So, in my opinion, I think the judges got it correct, as close as this might be, and as big of a fan of Robert Whitaker as I am, and as much as I'd like to see them fight for a third time, and that because if Whitaker won, they'd have to run it back. I just don't, I, I don't think he did enough in that second round. It was, it was close. It was close. Right? And I'm not mad at anybody who says they think Whitaker won, rightfully so. I've even seen some people giving the third round to Whitaker. That's also fine. Okay, like there's There was a lot of things that happened in this fight that it really comes down to, from your perspective, which shots did more damage in what round, who had more control in the rounds where the damage was even. You know, Do you consider octagon control more important for you than positional control and the takedowns that didn't do anything? Or do you consider those takedowns doing slight damage because, you know, there is impact? There, they weren't high-altitude high, high altitude, uh, takedowns, but they were takedowns that brought, you down, brought him down to the mat nonetheless. So he is actively trying to finish the fight. He's trying to advance position. He did kind of go for a rear naked choke, and that's a submission attempt. So there's a lot of things that happen in this fight. There's a lot of nuance that went into this, and I think you can make, like I've said a thousand times already, right? Whitaker could have won this fight. And I don't think, <clears throat> I don't think that's outlandish. Okay. In my opinion though, watching it back, Adesanya did enough for me. Now let's talk about what happened afterwards. As far as opinions, Whitaker during the interview says, I'm gutted. I felt like I did enough to win. And Let's take a back, like if you're, if you're feeling, if you just had an emotional response or a gut, gut response to that saying like, oh, get the fuck out of here. What, how could he think he wins? And then, or on the opposite side, maybe you just thought like, of course he won. Like, look what he fucking, let's take a step back from that. Let's take a step back. 
why would Whitaker feel like he won from inside there? And I know that we weren't in there, so we don't know what he was exactly feeling, but we can take some good guesses. He probably didn't feel that Adesanya was doing a lot of damage to him. It didn't feel like he did a lot of damage, right? And Whitaker also knows how scoring works round by round, okay? He knows that he lost the first round. He got dropped. It is what it is. But after that, he felt like he won every single round. Now, being in there, if you feel like that none of those shots did any damage to you and you blocked most of them, which he did, like, th this was a very inactive fight as far as, like, strikes thrown, okay? And there was a lot of misses. So if you feel like that, and then you also got the takedowns and you landed shots of your own, I think it's understandable to think that you won that fight from your perspective. And for those of you on the how could Whitaker feel like that side, try to imagine being in a fight and you never feel like you're hurt and you feel like you land good shots and you've done damage and you went for takedowns and you were trying to finish the fight and you were doing the forward, pre you had forward pressure and you were doing the advancing. Would you feel like you won that fight? Probably. All right. And then for you on the other side saying, oh, of course you won that. Like, I think you can already uh, maybe take a step back from that and say, oh, from his perspective, this is why he won, not just because obviously he won. So I understand Whitaker's frustration. I can, un sorry, I can understand Whitaker's frustration. And rightfully so, I understand why, why people or why he specifically thought he won. It was a close fight, even for everybody on the outside watching. I, watch it again. Go back and tell me it was a complete shutout and you're a liar. You just are. Because it was it was so close, even round by round. All right, and for those of you guys who have watched this channel for uh, for a year now, or a couple years, or however long you've been watching, you might have heard me harp on this before. Adesanya has made a statement that drives me up the fucking wall. The short version, which I've heard from the likes of Rashad Evans and Kamaru Usman and Paul Felder. Uh, Michael Bisping, I'm, pr I'm pretty sure, has said this at one point. The short version is, you got to beat the champ to be the champ. Now, taken literally, that's an obvious statement. The most obvious of all obvious statements. Clearly, no shit, you have to win the fight to get the, get the win. Duh. The implication is, you need to do more than the champ does to you to win the fight meaning if there is a tie the tie goes to the champion and in some people's opinion you have to do more than that like it can't it can't be slightly in your favor it has to be overwhelmingly in your favor to beat the champion this is empirically and absolutely fucking stupid it's false it's dumb pick your adjective i don't care it's asinine to keep saying this it's asinine to believe it it makes no sense i'm so sick of hearing it the fact that professional fighters still have this fucking opinion drives me nuts i've heard commentary live commentary say this stuff this is unacceptable not only are you in this scenario the commentary team didn't say it so i'm not harping on them but they did do a poor job commentating this fight so i'm gonna lump them in with this you are doing a disservice to the sport of mma and to the viewers and consumers of the product by saying objectively false statements like that and misleading them into thinking a certain way because from then on you might have set an opinion that will change how they view things going forward that will make their experience less enjoyable because of this false false shit that has just been spewed out by someone with with experience and authority 
Easy example right here. I'm the current champion. You're the challenger. It's a five-round fight. Okay? The first three rounds, we do identical things. Everything. Every movement, everything is identical except you land one more punch than I do in each of the first three rounds. That will give you a score of 30 for you to 27 for me. Right? You understand what I'm saying here? Let me say that again. So each round, let's say I land 10 strikes, you land 11. Everything else is identical. Each strike was identical. And none of those strikes, that none of those three extra strikes, both the, the 11, the one that you landed in the first, second, and third, giving you 11, 11, 11 to my 10, 10, 10, none of those extra shots you did put me down or almost finish me. Therefore, you get a 10, 9 in each round. 10, 9, 2018, 30, 27 is the total. If in the last two rounds, I outstrike you by 20, and these are significant strikes, significant enough to count for that statistic, but not significant enough to put you on your ass or give me a 10-8 in either one of those rounds. If you judge the fight as a whole, I have outstruck you, I probably have outdamaged you, and I probably look better than you do as far as physical damage that I have received, right? The wear wearing of the damage, let's say. Guess what? You still get the belt. It doesn't matter. You could beat me by 0.1 in three rounds, and I beat you by 10 in two rounds. Unless those rounds are so significant that I get a 10-8, you're going to win. That's how fucking MMA scoring works. So, yes, if you want to be the champ, you have to beat the champ. Yes, in Whitaker's opinion, he did that. He beat you in two Four and five. In fact, I think he thought he also won three. I think he w thought he won every round after that. So in his opinion, he did do enough to beat the champ. Or to be the champ, right? He did slightly more than you, in his opinion, in each one of the rounds, giving him the the, the win. I, I, I can't stand this opinion. I can't stand that statement. And going forward, I never want to hear it again. Of course we're going to. But it really needs to leave the MMA lexicon. It, we, can't, we can't say this anymore. We just can't. It's setting up everybody who believes it for failure. It's setting up arguments <laughs> that don't need to exist. It makes no sense. Like, there's no reason to say it. There's no reason to have this discussion. I never want to talk, talk about this again. I'm sure I will. Anyway, let's really quickly talk about where these two guys go from here. Adesanya looked phenomenal in this fight, by the way. Okay? I thought he looked really good. I feel like he he did enough to win. I feel like he did enough to win. I said that already. I gave my opinion on that. I, I feel like he did enough to win. And I feel like Whitaker did an amazing job. These two are clearly the best two in this division. What? Who does it, it, uh, Israel fight? Based off what I said a couple weeks ago, I still think he should fight Strickland. Um, but because of the fight that happened earlier in the night, he'll probably end up fighting um, Jared Cannonier. So uh, it's a fresh matchup. I don't think the records really warrant it. But because of the rankings and uh, the timeline and when they fought and just, you know, shooting your shot, man. They, you shoot your shot, uh, you, you get it more often than uh, those who don't. So uh, Jared Cannonier is probably next for him. What does Whitaker do? Well, Whitaker takes on Strickland now. I'm okay with that. It's a fresh matchup. We haven't seen it. Uh, you know, I don't want to see Whitaker Vittori. It does nothing for me. Uh, I mean, that one could happen, but it does. I mean, actually, you know, that one's okay, too. Uh, Whitaker Costa was supposed to happen. Sean Strickland really needs a, a fight in here, though. Okay, so maybe it's Strickland and Vittori or Strickland and Costa. But Strickland needs to get a fight in here because if he gets one more win, he should be challenging for the title. So uh, that's 
that's what I think should happen for these two guys uh, going forward here. All right. Overall, entertain relatively entertaining fight. It was a it was a chess match of a fight. I feel like every fight with Izzy is going to be like this going forward. I I don't see him getting in many wars like he did with Kelvin Gastelum unless you know someone's willing to take that punishment and really. I don't know. It's I think he's a great champion. I think he's a great striker. I think his MMA ability has just elevated so much since his debut. I think he's fun to watch, fun to watch, fun to listen to on the mic. But he's going to have the same problem that. Uh, actually, I think he's in a better position than Anderson Silva was because with Anderson Silva, with the shutouts he was pitching, it wasn't as interesting. Uh, but they f- have a very similar problem in that they sit around and their fights can often end up being sinkers. Go back and watch some of Anderson Silva's fights. Yeah, he's got a lot of highlights, rightfully so, and he's probably one of the best strikers in MMA history. He's probably one of the best fighters in MMA history. Uh, but not all of his fights were winners. <laughs> some of them were real stinkers. Very boring fights. All right, let's talk about the co-main event here. All right, so something interesting happened here. Uh, Derek Lewis taking on Tai Tuovas. Obviously, they were fighting in Houston. This took place in Houston. Derek Lewis is from Houston, so he had the home crowd with him. Blah blah blah. But everybody loves Tai Tuovas. Um, he is down to clown. <laughs> so uh, Tai Tuovas ends up getting the KO in the second round here uh, via a uh, a right elbow with him holding the back of Derek Lewis's head and throwing the right elbow, uh, creating a lot of pressure. There's some talk about there about Derek Lewis diving. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. I seen him quit before and how he fell down. It's, it, it's in, inconsequential. I don't care. We're not going to, we're not going to go down that conspiracy theory. So for the first 40 seconds, nothing was happening. Okay. Ty moved into the clinch and double unders until the ref separated them, which was, you know, pretty quick in my opinion, but that's okay. Shit happens. And then Lewis got the clinch and start, uh, he got a leg trip and landed some big ground and pound. And this is the one where a lot of people are going to show on the replay. How did Ty Tuovasa survive this? I, I mean, he just has a good chin. The dude used to spar with uh, Mark Hunt, also Mark Hunt, who beat Derek Lewis, famous for his ch- chin as well. Tai Tuovasa does have a heavyweight chin, and this is why I tell you, or I, not you specifically, but I have said in the past that the Derek Lewis technique and strategy of land a big shot and knock someone out, and that's it, is not a. It's not a uh, recipe for long term success and championship, uh, championship fights, or you know. Def- championship defenses absolutely that and this is why because sometimes you know it's heavily in your favor when you're the striker or the the guy with the power and the the opponent doesn't have it but this is heavyweight so a lot of people have it so now you're looking at it as are people willing to stand and trade with you Tai Tuovasa is willing to stand and trade does he have the power he absolutely does so now we're looking at a 50 50 (laughs) that's the best case scenario and now is he a better striker than you? Then the odds go in his favor if he's willing to stand in there and trade with you. And then if he's a way better striker and he doesn't want to trade with you, but he can dictate where the fight takes place, i.e. Cyril gone. Well, now we're looking at a shutout and you're not doing anything. So like I said, anyway, it's just not a good strategy for, it, yes, you're going to have a lot of fun knockouts and you're going to win, uh, especially if you have that power, you're going to win more often than you don't when you're dealing with heavyweights, people who lack athleticism in general, people who don't have that heavyweight chin, people who probably shouldn't be fighting in the UFC, but because heavyweight is so thin, they are. All right, so um, Tai Tuivasa got up from that. Like Lewis was like really... Laying into him, but Tuivasa gets up and just starts swinging back at him, and Lewis had to take quite a few steps back because <laughs> he did not want any part of that. So that first round was as heavyweight a first round as you will ever see in MMA. Okay, two guys who stood still. Okay, 
they stood still for a significant period of time. <laughs> then there was some sloppy clinching. Then there was some sloppy striking. There was some really big shots landed, followed up by more heavy swinging, and then the round ends. <laughs> so that is as heavyweight a round as you will ever see in MMA. Okay. It had everything about heavyweight, the good and the bad. Now, the good far outweighed the bad in this first round. It was fun to watch, entertaining, all that. Uh, first round clearly goes to Derek Lewis, 10 9. So, in the second round, Tai Tuavasa lands a good uh, inside low kick and it opens up Derek Lewis. Derek Lewis has horrible legs, okay? He has really weak legs, his knees especially. His knees and his back are shot. It's because he doesn't take care of himself and he doesn't take this seriously and he doesn't work as hard as he possibly could to fix those problems or deal with that stuff. He cashes paychecks and he makes his money and he gets in and gets out. And I'm not going to begrudge the guy because he's obviously been extremely successful at that. There's no problem with it. Plus, he's also very entertaining. He's a really fun guy to listen to. He's a fun guy to follow on Instagram if you don't. He's also a genuinely nice individual. <laughs> like He does a lot of cool things. It's He's... He's not a bad person, but if you're if you're going to emulate somebody to have a success yeah, a successful career in MMA, I, I would not go with Derek Lewis. Okay, I wouldn't. That's not the guy I would emulate. Uh, Lewis was compromised by that uh, inside low kick, and then there was but Lewis landed a few good shots of his own. These guys were throwing sloppy shots back and forth, and then Tai Tuivasa landed an elbow in close. And then a fi the final shot was uh, a, that that elbow in the clinch and put him down. And then Lewis falls face first, although he did reach out and support himself so he didn't, like, crack his head on the canvas the way you would see if someone was really out cold. Um, it is what it is, man. Uh, this is heavyweight. Shit happens. What are you going to do? Right? What are you going to do? I told you before. I, I told you before the fight. I'll say it before every Derek Lewis fight. This is what you should expect. Sloppy bullshit that happens. Either Derek Lewis gets the win by knockout, or we're looking at a decision win, or a knock. Like that's what I'm saying. Is like the the only thing you're not likely to see is a Derek Lewis decision, <laughs> right? It has happened in the past, but uh, recently it's kind of just it's not it's not likely. He doesn't have the output. He doesn't do anything. Now he can win some sneaky decisions, similar to how Yoel Romero used to. Uh, Derek Lewis does do that by landing one good shot and then not doing anything. So um, this now puts uh, Tai Tuivasa uh, in second place for the longest win streak in heavy in the heavyweight division, behind only our champion in Francis Ngannou. So Tai Tuivasa has won five in a row, and Francis Ngannou is at six. So. Uh, the caliber of opponent that Tai Tuivasa has faced in the last five has not been um, it, listen it's six knockouts or five knockouts I'm not mad at him uh, knocking out Stefan Struve that's a good win it, Stefan Struve is one of the biggest letdowns in the heavyweight division in history uh, Harry Hunsucker is nothing. Uh, Greg Hardy win after getting cracked by Greg Hardy. Greg Hart knocking out Greg Hardy like that—that that was a really good win for him. Augusto Sakai is a, ch a, a a relatively tough opponent, so that was a good win. And then obviously knocking out Derek Lewis. Derek R Lewis before this weekend was ranked number three. Augusto Sakai was ranked number twelve. Right, I'm just putting in perspective. Uh, Tai Tuivasa jumped up ahead of Sakai, getting it number eleven here. So. What is likely to happen is Derek Lewis is going to drop down the rankings, probably falling just above Chris Dawkins here. So I wouldn't be surprised to see Derek Lewis at number seven and then everybody else dropping down. Uh, so Dawkins to eight, nine, ten, like, oh, no. Yeah, they're all going to have to move down because Tai Tuivasa is probably going to bounce up to... Uh, like probably right in here, five or six. I don't think he's going to trade play. I don't think he's going to jump all the way to third. Although he could because of that win streak. Anyway, after this fight, who what do you, what do you guys want to see? My opinion, based off of his wins, I see no reason why Tai Tuivasa should not be given a title shot. Fuck, fuck off. Like, you just gave Derek Lewis a title shot for knocking out three guys. He's knocked out five including Derek Lewis. 
Let's go. Give him a title shot. Oh, Francis and Gon was out for a while. Cool. Do another interim belt. Have him fight Miocic. Have him fight Gon. Like, he needs to fight for a title. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's that's it for that. And what 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 do we do with Derek Lewis? Find an interesting matchup for him. So yeah, he could fight Stipe, but I don't want to see that. I don't think anybody wants to see that. Because, I mean, do you want Stipe to get knocked out? And then end his career like that because Lewis isn't trying to fight for a title. He doesn't give a shit, and Miocic is. So you know you want to have fun fights with Lewis. Let's have some fun fights. Have him fight Rosenstruck. Let's go. Okay. Have him fight uh, freaking. Uh, no, he fought Tibera already. Have him fight Tom Tom Aspinall. Walt Harris. There's there's plenty of fun matchups for Derek Lewis in the top fifteen, uh, and interesting matchups. He's already faced Curtis Blades, Volkov, Dawkins. We don't need to see those again. Cause like that 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 happens when we have like a log jam or someone's trying to fight for a title, and he should not be fighting for a title after getting knocked out like that again. Like let's put him back, put him in some fun fights. If he puts two in a row together, fine, whatever. All right. Let's go. Oh, by the way, this was performance of the night. Yeah, Tai Tuivasa got performance of the night for that knockout. We got a performance bonus. Okay. Jared Cannonier, the killer gorilla, taking on Derek Brunson. Ooh, this first round was interesting. <laughs> so the first take a takedown attempt from Brunson at uh at four minutes. Uh he got him down for 20 seconds, but no, no, sorry. He took him. It took him 20 seconds to get the takedown, but he ended up getting him against the cage. No damage, and then uh, Cannonier gets back up. Cannonier was having some success with low kicks. Brunson not looking so smooth out there. The takedown attempts are very obvious, but he got another one with 120 left. And then uh, Cannonier gets back up after 30 seconds of no damage. So to this point, there's 30. Uh, <clears throat> About 50 seconds left in the round. And then with ten sec with like 30 seconds left or 20 seconds left, Brunson landed a counter right hook and rocked Cannoneer. Got a rear naked choke under the chin and squeezed. But the problem was that was with 10 seconds left, no finish. So Brunson gets the first round, 10-9, but that's, that's it. Doesn't get the win. Second round, both guys moving a little bit slow, but Jared Cannonier looking like the fresher fighter. Uh, There's more success in this uh, second round on the feet for Cannonier. Uh, the clinch led uh, Cannonier to rocking him with an elbow and then wobbled him, uh, while wobbled him as he got back up uh, with a backhand. And not got back up. He wobbled him with a backhand. So Brunson fell down, and Jared ends end up getting a ground and pound and finishing him with an elbow. Uh, the the towel came in as the last one, the last elbow was being thrown. The referee did a bad job. Who was refing this fight? Kerry Hatley. Yeah, he did a bad job because, you know me, I'm always in, a fa in favor of a definitive end to a fight. And I feel like the referee almost did a perfect job, except, like, I think he called it at the right time. But he didn't do the thing that you're supposed to do is protect the fighter. So as those elbows are coming down, if you're ready to call a fight, you got to dive over that over his head or push the fighter off. You can't just tap the guy. You can't, especially when they're light or uh, middleweights like this, right? Like maybe in the smaller divisions, like you, like if you're a bigger guy, you can tap them and kind of like do a nice little side shove and then they'll be fine. But these bigger dudes, you got to like, you got to shove them. Okay, you can't let him throw that next punch because you've already dictated that the fight should be over. Okay, and that's fine. I think he did a really good job with the timing. Maybe he could have stopped at one earlier. That's fine. But when you make that decision, you got to follow through and follow through is not, hey, buddy, can you please stop punching him in the face now? Can you please stop? No, dude, you got to get in there. Protect the fucking fighter, please. I think Brunson took an extra shot that he didn't need to take. Uh, it's unfortunate for Brunson. It puts a stop to his, uh, to his win streak. Obviously, I don't think he's ever fighting for a title saying that, you know, he's only got two more fights, including this one before retirement. So his next fight is likely to be his last fight. 
So it's unlikely that he's ever going to fight for a title unless he changes his mind. So it's unfortunate because I think he did. He has put on, like, we went over it last week, but he put on a pretty good pretty good win streak right here, beating Elias Theodoro, Ian Heinish, Edmund Shabazi, and Kevin Holland, Darren Till. He, he really did go on a tear, and he did a good job, and I feel like he revamped his career right here. Um, it's unfortunate that he didn't. I don't know if he's ever fought for a title. I mean, he's he's done so well. His win loss record in the UFC is, is is fantastic. I think he's done an excellent job. He's twenty three and eight in his total career. And how many fights does he have in Strike Force in the UFC? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Mm mm mm. Oh wait a minute. Yeah, okay. So he's got 24 fights in the UFC. So majority of the fights in his career are coming from the UFC, and he's it's he's a, he's an excellent fighter. He just never could put it put everything together at all at the same time to get that get over the hump and get the win. It's unfortunate that it's going to come to an end uh, this way. But on the flip side, we have Jared Cannonier taking that step up again. So now he's on a two fight win streak. Obviously beating or obviously beating Brunson this weekend, but previously beating Calvin Gastelum with his only loss in this uh, six fight uh, set here to Robert Whitaker. So I said earlier that his wins don't necessarily dictate that he deserves a title shot because I think Strickland should get it. But like I said, you know, Cannoneer is an interesting matchup, and he specifically called for it after the fight. He pointed at Dana, said, "I want the title shot. I'm next." I can't argue with it. I think, you know, he'll probably end up getting the title shot after this. As far as Brunson goes, uh, who we fight, who, who, who's Brunson fighting after this? You know, Cannoneer was ranked three uh, before this weekend. He's likely to move up to number... He might not move. I hope they don't pull Whitaker down because he still is, in my opinion, the number one contender. Because I wouldn't mind seeing that fight run back immediately. As much as like it doesn't make sense commercially, I think competitively it could be run back again. It's just it's not going to happen. So maybe Whitaker takes the sec- number two spot and Cannoneer d- jumps jumps the line here and gets number one. That's fine. So who would we like to see Derek Brunson fight as his retirement fight here? Strickland's a good option. Coast is a good option. Kelvin Gaslam is a good option. Kelvin Gaslam looking to get a win. Maybe that's his spot. Maybe that's how he does it. So there's lots of good options for him out there for his retirement fight. I think uh, we'll talk about more about his place in the division's history after uh, his next fight after he retires. All right. Uh, most of these other ones I don't think we're going to spend too much time on. Hopefully. I'm trying to keep this a little bit shorter. So, uh Alexander Hernandez and Hinato Makano. Uh, first round, uh, Makano kept diving for takedowns, but not doing it very effectively. But then uh, uh, with 2.30 left to work on top. But yeah, so he ended up ended up getting a body lock and getting on top with uh, half the round to work. And he was uh, on top for 50 seconds. Didn't really do any damage. Uh Hernandez got up and tried to be aggressive, really didn't do anything. But, you know, it was a close round, but the control time went to Mocano, in my opinion. Yeah, see, but those striking numbers, see, I, I wrote in here, got to look. It doesn't matter because in the second round, Moicano ended up rocking him. Uh, he he hurts Alex, and then he gets a rear naked choke, and Hernandez gets, uh, gets submitted. So... Uh, all that shit talk about being on the main card and blah, 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 getting submitted like that is not a good look. All right. Bobby Green taking on Nazrat Hackbrest. Mini Kelvin Gastelum. This fight was really fun to watch. Uh, I was wrong about this being fight of the night. I predicted that this was my fight to watch for fight of the night. I was wrong. Uh, that being said, it was still a fun fight to watch. Uh, Green starting the fight normally how he does, you know, with his jab, working a lot, just his volume. That's that's the story of this. We can sum up this Entire fight in volume, right? 38 of 71, 71 of 141, 79 of 143. Just volume, volume, volume. Just constantly throwing stuff out there, constantly touching, constantly, just nonstop out there. Just push, 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 push. And he was just constantly moving forward. 
Oh, he also has the most significant strikes in lightweight history, which is interesting. I did not. I, I don't know how that's possible. I mean, I get it. He does throw a lot of strikes, but like that's. It, I don't feel like he's been fighting long enough to get that. Uh, do 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 do. There's an eye poke. You don't have to talk about that. Um. Yeah, dude. The first round easily went to went to green. Second round, more of the same. It's just he. We don't have to go round by round because each round was the same. Bobby Green shucking, rolling with all the shots. Yeah, Hack Prass landed a few good shots, and he did a good job every so often landing something. But Green just kept with the output, man. And he's got a chin. He moves really well with shots. So even when you tag him, it doesn't do the damage that it should. Green should be ranked after this weekend. He really should. Oh, hey, look, Saldi Amato got the score right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, dude, green, green should be ranked after this weekend. He really should. He should be somewhere in the top 15. All right. <laughs> this fight is hilarious. Okay. So Andre Arlovsky is currently, I think he's on three fight. Yeah. Andre Arlovsky getting the decision win. So he just... Uh, he stayed in the pocket in this fight more than he has in his past couple wins. And in his last streak of like six or seven fights, he stayed in the pocket longer in this fight than he has in those. Uh, he looked more confident in his right hand. He was throwing big shots this time, not kind of kind of not just trying to outpoint him, but still staying safe. And he did a very good job. I'm not going to get into it. I talk about it every time <laughs> Arlovsky gets a win now. Hopefully... Uh, we can talk about it after his next one because he should be ranked after this weekend. <laughs> Arlovsky again. Like I said, there is a scenario in which Arlovsky in 2022 or 2023 could be fighting for a title in the UFC. This is absolutely crazy. Um, he landed a lot of big overhand rights. First round easily went to him. Uh, there was two cup shots in a row by Jared Vandera kind of bullshit and obviously it was an accident but it was really stupid um and the Orlovsky did more damage in the first and the second round uh 30 30 to 23 and then 20 to 19 so the second round's striking numbers were close and the commentary team kept wrongfully said so here's the thing uh I wrote this live striking numbers had Vandera up uh I knew they weren't I made a note of it and they were wrong. The live striking numbers. This is got guys. This is why you can't go just by the live striking numbers. You got to watch the fight, right? Your eyes aren't lying to you. Right? You got to pay attention. Uh, Thirty to twenty-three in favor of Arlovsky, and then like the commentary team was b believing that shit and saying, "Oh, but the you know Vandera's up on the numbers, but Arlovsky looks like he's winning." L trust your eyes, guys. Trust your eyes. He was outlanding him. 30 to 23 and then 20 to 19 plus he was landing the bigger shots in the second round so there's no uh no reason to think Vandera won the second round clearly and then in the third round Vandera did a better job but Arlovsky was playing it safe and you could tell by the end like he knew he won that fight so fucking <laughs> it's 2022 and fucking Andre Arlovsky is on a three fight win streak in the UFC heavyweight division <laughs> i mean <laughs> the insanity of this division is it's just never ending it never it it never ceases to amaze me if you would have told me in 2010 right or 2009 like after he got knocked out by uh well, well obviously when he got knocked out by fedor it, like that wasn't a bad performance he was beating the shit out of fedor before then in elite uh in uh, uh affliction but if you had would have told me when he fought Mm, who did he get knocked out by? Ah, I don't remember. It doesn't matter. If you would have ta told me when he was getting knocked out by underweight fighters in tw 2010, if you told me right that day, hey, Andre Arlovsky is going to come back to the UFC in four years. He's going to go on a win streak fight a title eliminator, go on a loss streak, go on a win streak, go on a loss streak, and go on another win streak, and he's he might be fighting for a title eight years after he had his uh, title eliminator fight. <laughs> what the fuck, man? Like, I would not have... I'd be like, dude, I, you're crazy. That's impossible. This is Andre Arlovsky we're talking about, the same guy who fought on, like, UFC 30. 
<laughs> Come on. Holy shit. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Uh, I mean, good for him. I'm always excited. I'm never, I'm, I'm always going to root for Arlovsky. I don't care who he's fighting. Like, even if he fights Stipe, I love Stipe and all, but, you know, the story with Arlovsky is too great. Fresca for the win. I have never seen a commercial for Fresca. Ever. And the only people I've ever seen drink it are my family. But it's still on store shelves. So someone else is drinking it. Who out there is drinking Fresca? I've I've seen people, like when I was on Twitch, I mentioned Fresca and someone said, I love Fresca. So I know out, people out there drink it. And peop, my friends have come over here and had Fresca. And they're like, oh my God, what is this? This has no calories in it. This is so good. <laughs> like, So uh, like, they haven't seen it before. They've never tried it. Who's buying it? I'm not mad. I'm glad because I love it. It's my favorite. <laughs> All right, guys. This one is uh, a bit of an emotional fight, I guess. Uh, Roxanne Motifari taking on Casey O'Neill. This was uh, Motifari's last fight. She mentioned it beforehand. You know, this was her retirement fight. This was going to be the last time she stepped in the octagon. Uh, before we get into anything, I will just say Casey O'Neill dominated this fight bell to bell okay 72 to 44 86 to 35 and 71 to 41 okay uh do i think motifari could have done something different to win this fight yes if you look up here at these takedown numbers she attempted four and got two takedowns she got them pretty easily by the way i think she could have taken casey o'neill down early and done some grindy work and eked out a victory here and ended her career with a victory but I said this beforehand, but or I was thinking it because I was watching it by myself, so I'm not going to sit here and like talk to myself, although I do that too. Uh, I was thinking that, oh, she's probably doing this because she wants to have an exciting fight to be her last one, and then that's exactly what Daniel Cormier said, so I'm not the only one who thought it. Oh, I'll mention the scoring in this, but we got to also talk about the Arlovsky one. Um, anyway, what can we say... Uh, like this clearly went to Casey O'Neill. There was no no point in this fight where I thought Ro uh, Roxanne Motifari was winning. Uh, she was clearly outmatched as usual, out strength, out speed, out striked, everything. It's just she wins by just grinding out fighters, making them tired, making them work harder than they want to work, making them uncomfortable, being awkward in there. She just works harder than you, and she get that's how she gets her wins. So. Scorecards were 29-28 for Casey O'Neill, 29-28 for Casey O'Neill, and then Robert Alexander giving it 29-28 to Roxanne Modafari. He also gave the next fight, which was Arlovsky versus uh, Vandera, he gave that fight to Vandera. He did it fucking two times in a row. This guy is a dunce. Keep that name in mind, guys. Robert Alexander, absolute dunce. Horrible. Anyway. Roxanne Modafari, uh, I, I, I said it in the preview for this, so maybe I won't spend so much time on it. If you look at her record, it's not stellar, right? You know, she had a four-fight losing streak here, wins one, loses one. Then she goes win-loss, and then she's on a three-fight losing streak to end her career. She's only a 20, she's basically, a, she's almost a 500 fighter, uh, 25 and 21. But she started her career so long ago. She's a true, like, the word pioneer gets thrown around, and it feels meaningless at this point. And it doesn't really have any, like, weight to it. But it means a lot for, fe uh, not female MMA, but it means a lot when it comes to a fighter like her who was doing it way before it was there was any money in it, right? Essentially, Roxanne Motafari was fighting in MMA at the same time. No, sorry. The way, when she started for women in MMA was similar to when Oof. Like, ho not not quite Hoist Gracie, but almost. Like when Hoist Gracie was fighting in MMA, when he first started. There's very little money in it to little to none, right? You can't really make a career. And she was doing it for the love of the sport. She was never the most athletic, never the strongest, never the best striker. It's just... 
she's just a genuinely good person. She's a writer. She you know she does uh she writes for one of the MMA uh, websites. Her nickname is the Happy Warrior because that's what she is. You know, she's in a she's an anime nerd. Uh, it's it's hard to say anything bad about her. There's nothing bad to say, and the worst thing you can say about her is maybe she shouldn't have been in the UFC. But I think that's bullshit because she's shown through sheer will and determination that she belongs in there multiple times. Stopping the hype train of multiple people, dude. It's just. She's in. I don't think she was ever going to win a title in the UFC, barring some crazy circumstances. Like maybe she could have got there, but it's one of those things where she gave herself the best opportunity to succeed that she possibly could. Never, never taking the easy way out. Never quitting on herself. This. Grit and determination. And like you see that on in certain fighters, like during a fight, and yeah, we we give them credit. Like you know the Darren Elkins, right? Because they're like almost just like emotional victories when he's just getting beat pillar to post and then makes a comeback. Versus uh, like Mursad Bektik and stuff, or when uh, you know when I watch Justin Gagey fight every time when he's just getting. You know, rocked over and over again. He just doesn't quit and keeps moving forward. Motafari has that exact same thing, but far less skills, far less talent. She has been, she has no physical gifts. Okay. She has nothing. Nothing was given to her. She earned every fucking thing that she ever had in MMA. Go back and watch her old fights. Dude. The most unskilled shit you'll ever see. Bare bones MMA. Doesn't matter. Like, she just... Like, all all you guys out there who think you're tough and all that stuff. Some of you guys, I'm sure, are very tough. But to be taken to the brink in some of the fights that she has had. And taken the damage and the punishment that she's had. And she just... Fucking takes a deep breath, wipes the blood off her face, and fucking goes forward. Then this fight, she got punched in the face, what, how many times in the first round? 81% of 72. I don't know. 50 times. 60 times she got punched in the face in this first round and never once took a pass, a real back step. Second round, more of the same. 86. 71 in the third round. Dude, she never stopped. She kept throwing. She got more accurate as the fight went on. She got. She just never quit. I said I wouldn't spend a lot of time on these, but this was her last fight in her career, and uh, it does worth. It's worth noting that she she did everything she could with what she was given, and if not more, I, I think there are worse people to emulate in life than Roxanne Modafari. Far worse people. I wish her nothing but the best. I really do. Um, I may have said, like, when I first got exposed to her fighting, maybe I might have said some negative things, saying she doesn't belong in there, this and that. And I think skill-wise, rightfully so. But she has shown time and time again that, you know, her determination, this is what it looked like. This is what true grit and determination looks like from someone who has no gifts. They have not been given anything. Right, not some secret like this isn't like oh some secret secret door you unlock and I find this uh this hidden skill that I didn't know that I had. None of that. She kept digging deeper, couldn't find a single thing, didn't care. Just kept working. Nothing but fucking ins- inspirational. Awesome to watch, awesome to listen to, great fighter, great person. I can't wait to read some of the stuff she writes and see her in the corner of other people going forward, so all right, this was a fun fight. Uh, Kyler Phillips versus uh, Marcelo Rojo. Dude, Phillips it just looked like a maniac out there. We're going to go through this one a little bit faster. Uh, these are the prelims. Right, yes, the Arlovsky fight was the last fight in the prelims. So. All right, uh, Phillips just out in front after the first. Just more output, and we can see here, 34 to 15, landing more, more variety, doing more, do, just... 
it, both these fighters looked good. Kyler Phillips looked like he was on another level on Saturday. It's just unbelievable. Looks so good. Second round was closer in the striking numbers, but and uh, Phillips seemed to be slowing down, but he just did more damage, bigger strikes. He just did more. And you know, the first two rounds I got I got going to Phillips twenty eighteen, but the third round is we don't need to score anymore because Phillips worked his ass off. Gets into a position, gets trying to try, uh, gets in a mount, goes for a mounted triangle, flips over, turns the triangle into a uh, armbar, and gets a submission win. Fantastic fight, awesome. It, I, I love watching Kyler Phillips fight. I've seen him fight before, and you know he's had some cardio issues in the past. I really hope he works through them and he's worked them out because this dude has some insane, insane skill ceiling. So good. Uh, Carlos Alberg versus uh, Fabio Charant. Uh, Charant did not look like he wanted to be in there. Uh, not a lot of action early. There was some kicks from Alberg. Alberg is the light heavyweight Australian version of uh, Luke Rockhold. You know, he's a model. He's pretty. He goes in there with disdain. He keeps his head straight up. He doesn't defend himself very well, but he uses a lot of head movement. So uh, clearly all three rounds, 19 to 4, 27 to 7, 20 to 2. You can see on the striking numbers here, this is pretty much tells the tale of the exact, the fight. There was one moment where Charant caught um, Alberg behind the ear with a straight punch, like a stray shot, and Alberg lost his balance just a little bit. So maybe if you want to give him that second round, but whatever. No, 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 no. Uh, absolute garbage from Charant, man. He looked like shit in there. Uh, I... I think something might have been wrong with him because he looked like he didn't want to be in there at all. Uh, Alberg looked like, I mean, Luke Rockhold back in the day. Ronnie Lawrence versus uh, Mana Martinez. Uh, this fight was... Oh, this fight was really fun to watch because of the third round. But So uh, first two rounds, some really good leg kicks, some good damage, lots of... Uh, uh, takedown attempts from Lawrence, and he lands. He kept landing this ba these uh, right hands to put Martinez on his ass, and he dropped them three times in the first three rounds, I believe. Yeah, look at that number right there, three. Um, <laughs> he dropped them three times in the first two rounds. Clearly, the first two rounds go to Ronnie Lawrence, but then in the third round, Lawrence seemed to take a step, uh, uh, like his foot off the gas. Maybe it was because of exhaustion, but Martinez landed a spinning back fist and a few more shots and rocked Lawrence bad. He had him stumbling all over the place, and then uh, he moved in too much, and Lawrence grabbed the legs and got a takedown and got on top and rode out the round pretty much or rode out the fight pretty much. Uh, twenty nine twenty seven. He was uh, really close to fin finishing the fight in one of the rounds. I would have given him a ten eight. Uh, and one of the two of the judges agree with me. Twenty nine, twenty seven. This is how I scored it. So, um, this last round. A, a quick note here. I, I wrote it down. It makes sense. Uh, Swanson. You remember uh, probably about two months ago, Cub Swanson, uh, he with against Darren Elkins. So remember when he rocked Aaron Elkins and I made such a big deal about how he played uh, basically tag. Like, he, like I don't want to be touched by Darren Elkins when Darren Elkins was down on the ground reaching for legs and he kept switching sides and, like, avoiding being touched at all. That's why that's important, okay? That's why I was so surprised by it because this is usually what happens. What happened in this fight is usually what happens. The fighter moves in too close, gets his legs grabbed, and gets taken down. Now, it doesn't always happen. Sometimes you get the finish. I think the much better technique is what Cub Swanson was doing. And I think going forward, fighters really need to be on, on their toes, mind their pie, P's and Q's, whatever, whatever a silly saying you want to use, I don't care. They need to be more cognizant of that fact when they're going in for the finish. They really do. Because I think it's a small change, but a very important one. Because you don't have to completely disengage. You just have to treat their hands like they are the plague. <laughs> right? You treat their hands like they are your your worst fear. Like, if they touch you, you die. Because, especially in a situation where he would, he would he's going to lose the fight if he doesn't get the finish here. He's going to lose the fight. He needs to get the finish. Especially because there was a 10-8 round. Right, like one of the rounds is so bad. He needs to get the finish here. So you cannot let him touch you. And he did. He got taken down and unfortunately for him, rode out the round on his back and got uh <clears throat> got the loss. So 
that's one of those things, dude. You got to be you got to be more cognizant of what the other, what the opponent's trying to do to you. Uh, this one was weird. Good fight though. Uh, AJ Dobson in the first round here. Dobson versus Malcoon. Malcoon ended up getting the decision victory here. So uh, Malcoon was chasing chasing the takedowns early. Didn't get a lot going because Dobson was doing this uh, defense technique. So Malcoon was getting under the butt like you're supposed to on a takedown, and then on the lift, Dobson would actually shimmy and push his. Uh, push Malcoon's um or no sorry pull shimmy and pull his arms up over his butt so they weren't s- sunk in and then he would spread his legs and get his base backs and stop the takedown so that was pretty interesting and Daniel Cormier made a note of it as well saying that he's never seen that before and if Daniel Cormier hasn't seen something in wrestling that's effective it's pretty unique who anyway uh Dobson was very comfortable on the feet out landing and out damaging easy round uh for Dobson there then in the second and the third round Malcoon gets a takedown and just Khabib's his ass. <laughs> just uh, just puts him against the fence and lands short hooks all day. And you can see it in the, in the striking numbers. First round, 41 to 24, mainly contested on the feet. And that is why Dobson was ahead. But then 4 to 25 in favor of Malcoon and 7 to 31 in favor of Malcoon. Malcoon just outworked him, man. Got, kept grinding for those takedowns. Kept, kept putting him down. Kept working for it. And got the win. All right. Uh, this was fight of the night. This was absolute insanity coming from these two Bantamweights. Nutcases here. Um, Andrade, uh, Douglas Silva de Andrade versus Sergei Moro- uh, Morozov. Or Morozov? Morozov. Anyway. Morozov clearly won- winning the first round. He looked smooth out there. Uh, looked like he had more tools. He did a great job rocking Andrade multiple times, cutting the cutting the shit out of his eye. Looked great. And then in the second round, Andrade catches him with a left hook and drops Morozov. And then Andrade got poked in the eye, so nothing happened there. Like so, again, no penalty. Even though Moro- uh, Morozov gets a freaking thirty second break now. That's not fair. Andrade uh, landing some big punches and a knee, but Morozov just kept moving around. He, dude, he was taking so much damage, but then and then uh, eventually Andrade takes the back and gets a rear naked choke. Uh, this was fight of the night, uh, rightfully so. It was exciting. It wasn't sloppy heavyweights or s- sloppy fighters throwing big stupid hooks and stuff. There was a lot of technical fighting going on in here, which, yes, at times devolved into... Uh, uh, it, it devolved into uh, some sloppy fighting, but there was a lot of technique before then. So uh, that's a good fight overall. Jeremiah Wells taking on Blood Diamond. Blood Diamond, I think, coming from the city kickboxing camp. It was very strange. Uh, this fight started out with <laughs> Wells, Jeremiah Wells, running along the outside of the cage, just like completely sideways, right? Just circling the cage and then tripping and falling down. <laughs> fucking weirdest shit i have ever seen it's it's unfortunate uh that that happened but not unfortunate that he worked for a takedown got blood diamond down managed to get into mount did some damage and then uh eventually worked for a rear naked choke and put blood diamond out uh, unconscious so good for jeremiah wells <laughs> in auspicious start to say the least uh maxim grishin taken on william um william knight obviously i i said my piece on this i'm not going to go too in depth uh, we are running over the hour mark now so I said my piece on william knight missing weight by fucking 12 pounds it's unacceptable i don't think uh, I don't. I, I think forty percent of his purse might be enough. It's fine, whatever. I don't care. I think it's unacceptable to, to take a fight. M- judging by his physique, maybe there was something wrong. Um, maybe he has an injury, and that's why he took this fight was to get something paid for. I don't know his situation. I'm not saying William Knight is a bad individual. I'm not saying he's a bad person for taking this fight. I'm not telling him he's doing the things the wrong way. Okay, for him personally. But when it comes to MMA, especially at the highest level in the UFC, if you can't make the weight, you shouldn't be taking the fight. Now, if you're going to cut it close, shit happens, all right? I'm still, it's still not acceptable, but hey, shit happens. Now, you take a fight on short notice and, you know, oh, you know, I mistimed it here or I ate this when I shouldn't have. I had a weird reaction. I'm feeling sick. I couldn't get this done. My body's holding onto water. 
There are a thousand, a million different things that can happen. There's so many variables and shit can happen. And you miss weight by a pound here or there. You miss by half a pound. You just, just can't get the weight off. Shit happens. You know, I've even seen like three pounds where it's like, hey, I was cutting weight for the past two days. I had to cut 20 pounds. First of all, you shouldn't be doing that. So don't take the fight. But hey, you tried real hard, whatever. Fucking William Knight missed by 12 pounds. There's no reason he should have taken this fight. Not at light heavyweight. If he said, hey, yeah, I could fight at heavyweight, then no, nobody has a problem. Uh, Grisham, heavy with the leg kick, uh, leg uh, kicking attack early. Did the same thing for pretty much three rounds. Nothing doing. Who cares? He clearly won this fight super easily. William Knight did absolutely nothing. So the right guy won the fight. William Knight doesn't cut weight, cheats, and doesn't get the win. Loses almost half his purse. So he's been punished. It is what it is. All right. That is it. We are done talking about this card. Uh, I'm sorry that it is coming out a day late. I know less people are going to watch it because of that. It is what it is. Uh, I appreciate you guys making it to the end. If you did make it to the end, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel because I do this every week. I will put a shorter version of this out, uh, Adesanya versus Whitaker. I will put probably put that one out. I might do the tie to Avasa Derek Lewis one later this week. I might do a preview of the fights coming up uh, this weekend. I might not. I don't know yet. Um, but for sure, next Sunday I will do. Uh, I will be back on a normal schedule. So. Uh, this weekend was very weird. It was the last opportunity to go to Angels Landing before you have to win a lottery system. And we were there for a day. <laughs> this was in and out. So I really appreciate you all for making it this far. I really do. It means a lot to me. Thank you guys so much. Please tell me, what did you guys think about the fights? What did you guys think about the decision? Did you agree with the decision? Uh, Israel Adesanya getting the victory here. Did you think Whitaker did enough? You tell me. Let me know what you think. Uh, yeah, I will be back for sure. Next weekend, normal schedule on Sunday. So until then, hope you guys all have an amazing week. I really do. It means a lot to me that you guys watch this stuff. Love y'all.